Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz drummer Paul Shaw. During early April 2020, he opened up about being in quarantine in the heart of New York City and his new 2020 CD. He grew up in southern New Jersey and began playing drums at the age of five, and he has some interesting tales about Kansas City and gigs around the world. Enjoy. Man, yeah, thanks so much for uh, being willing to do this. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for taking some time out during these extraordinary times. How are you holding up up there? Woo! It's... um. It's really crazy. I live at I live at Broadway and Fifty Sixth, and oh, wow. it is uh, it's just crazy how dead it is. Everything's closed, um, and you know this is kind of a, this is a hotbed. So we haven't left our apartment. We haven't left the building in uh, two weeks now. Wow, <laughs> that's insane. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I, did, I did see some pictures and video of people going through Times Square and hot baths yes. and it was just empty and it's right. insane, you know. And now so. now there are now they're putting up we're seeing messages about why are you out <laughs> down in the subways. Yeah. It, it's like if you're not essential personnel, why are you even down here? <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. So it's like every just when I feel like man, I got fresh air. People are out there, I remember they're actually they're, they're, they really shouldn't be out there. At least, at least not here, not in, not in Manhattan. Yeah, but yeah. that's crazy. <laughs> How about you? How's yeah. you're in Lee's Summit? Is that right? Yeah, I'm in the hometown of Pat Metheny. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, Kansas City Metro is quite large, so it's uh, yeah. So that's that's you know, where I, I'm at right now. Do you recall? I don't know if you've ever. I don't know if you've ever gone and heard any Air Force big bands that come through there, but for six years, I came through there playing with a with a big band. Came through at uh, Lee's Summit and um, uh, oh, can, you know Kansas City, the, the general area, I think, and played a few concerts. We would go every summer and play some outdoor venues. Wow, yeah, I, I don't recall, and I've really ramped up what I do more lately, so. The chance uh-huh. of me catching something like that would probably be a little bit more uh, up my alley here. So more likely um, now, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. It's um, I, I mean, I think I I left that area. I left St. Louis in 2013, so it's been a little while. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, it's uh, there's there's a lot going on. I mean, hopefully it picks back up when all of this ends. But Kansas yeah. City has had a renaissance. It's a hotbed. There's a lot going on. So hopefully this doesn't. Uh, do too much to keep that from not coming back. Right. I hope not too. I hope it uh, yeah. You know, doesn't live long enough to kill everything that's that's been grown. You know. Yeah, without a doubt. So I guess one of the functions of doing these interviews is to kind of take a, a little break from everything that's going on. So thanks for taking a minute. I appreciate yeah. it. And thank you for thank you for the new music. Talk to me about the new music and what's coming out. So my new record is it's called Moment of Clarity. And it's um it's my debut as a band leader and soul composer and drummer. So it's really kind of stepping out a little bit from from what I usually do. I have a group that I co lead uh, that I've never written for, but have just always been a leader in other ways and and played drums. And we put our, our last record out in 2016. So this, other than being a sideman, this is my first project as as a leader. Um. It's got Alex Sipiagin, all New York folks. I met them all here, met most of them at New York University. And it's Alex Sipiagin playing trumpet, Brad Shepik playing guitar, and those two guys kind of function as the lead melody guys, along with Gary Versace at the piano. And then uh, Drew Grass is on bass, and I play drums. And that's out now. Um, it's I think it officially released on the 27th, um, and it's starting to, I was talking to my radio promoter person and who uh, works with records, who released the record. And that's supposed to start happening uh, this next week in terms of radio airplay around the country. So we'll see, see what happens with it. Yeah, very cool. So you're from Jersey, correct? I am. Yeah, I grew up in, okay. in South Jersey. Yeah. So talk yeah. to me a little bit about your childhood and how you got into you know, jazz and music. Yeah. Um, you know, interestingly, I, I, I grew up, I grew up on a, on a dead end street about three, four miles out of the center of town. 
and my grandparents lived on that street. Uh, my mom's sister and her family lived next to us. Um, and then her, my mom's childhood friends lived on the other side. Her brother also lived there with his family. So the whole back half of the street was our family. And my grandfather was a country western musician. He tore up and down the East Coast. And eventually both of her brothers had bands. So there was a point where at my grandmother, my grandparents' house, there was live music in the form of rehearsals uh, three, I mean, four or five nights a week. So that's kind of where I cut my teeth. And around five years old, I got my first set. Um, and then I met, I started taking lessons privately when I was nine. And I eventually met a guy named Chris Arezi, who's still in violin, we're still in touch, still an amazing teacher. And I started studying with him at 11. And he opened me up uh, to, like, it's like the music of Gino Vanelli in the 80s, which happened to have you know, a guy like Vinnie Caliuta on one of his drums, on one of his albums. Uh, Mark Craney was another drummer. And so I started learning all of these different drummers, not through jazz traditionally, but through all these other bands, these first crossover genres. And then at the age of 16, my next-door neighbor made me a cassette tape, he knew I was a drummer, of Max Roach Clifford Brown. Um, and that was my first jazz album with Delilah and Parisian Thoroughfare, all those great tunes. And I, I, you know, that was the beginning for me. And then from there, uh, you know, by the time I got through high school and, and that album, I would say was, oh, and also Led Zeppelin. Those two groups, Max Roach, Clifford Brown and Led Zeppelin, uh, kind of colored most of my learning before I got to, um, college and I, I went to, off to college at Rutgers uh, studied jazz, studied with Keith Copeland uh, at Rutgers from 90 to 1992 uh, Ralph Peterson was kind of outgoing but Ralph uh, Bowen on tenor was there Mike Mossman was there on trumpet uh, who I studied with um, so those were, those were really good times so yeah my childhood definitely a lot of varied music and I'm still into all those musics today uh, as a singer songwriter on the guitar um i've been doing that about 15 years and, but it was pretty natural because i came up you know with country with rock and roll and with jazz very nice so was it always just known that you were going to get into being a musician pretty much i i, I never really thought things would go any other way um i i didn't even think i was going to go to college until um I was just looking through a pamphlet, and it said jazz drum set. I said, okay, that I can do. <laughs> and I went, that's right. how I ended up at Rikers, you know. <laughs> um, I didn't finish, though. I, I actually took a gig that got me away from school, but I went back eventually and finished. And then came to working without, you know, having that degree for some time. Uh, what I ended up picking was the military when I saw you can play drums full time. And it was like, okay, I, I didn't really look any further. I just, it was like a moth to the flame. And, and doing 20 years in the military performing. So yes, that was never, there was never really any consideration about anything else. So talk to me a little bit about mentors. Who were the biggest influences mm. on you that you remember to today? Wow. You know, well, if you think of mentors and, you know, I kind of, Think of two categories, the people you listen to who hit you the most, and then the people you actually interface with and um, through studying or whatever or seeing live, you know. And I would say um, definitely, definitely John Bonham and Max Roach had to be the first two guys that I got into. John Bonham, uh, 12-ish, and uh, Max Roach around 16. And, um and then there was a magazine, a modern drummer magazine. I saw a picture of a drummer in there holding sticks traditionally. And I had always played match grip, and I decided I was going to learn traditional grip. So I did that. Um, Roy Haynes with Pat Mustaine, and I think it was a 1989 album called Question and Answer. Big influence. And then Roy Haynes became a big influence. Uh, I got to say Chris Arezi, my first teacher, because... Uh, he really opened my mind to a lot of ways to practice 
ways of playing the drums and, and a lot of different music I probably wouldn't have heard otherwise. Um, I should also mention uh, Between Nothingness and Eternity, the live Mob Vishnu Orchestra record. Uh, with, ooh, I saw, oh, man, it was either Billy Cobham or Michael Walden. I cannot remember. Oh, I think it was Michael Walden on the drums. That album blew my mind early, as did Intermounting Flame, which was Billy Cobham. Um, a couple teachers that really, other than Chris, um, I think that are worth mentioning would be, um, I took a couple lessons with Jeff Hamilton in my early 20s, uh, one with Peter Erskine, uh, one with Joe Morello. Those were, those were like mind blowing. Um, and long lasting, you know, one, one time with, with, with each Peter and Joe, and I think three maybe with Jeff. And those were lessons that lasted me a lifetime. And then more recently, uh, I spent four years with uh, learning from Ari Honig, who's my age, and uh, just getting into some more super advanced kind of ways of thinking about rhythm, uh, not just as a individual, but moving together as a rhythm section. And those, I think that kind of sums up uh, a lot of where I come from as a player. Those those names. See what was the first live jazz show that you oh. saw that made you think, you know, I really want to do this. Okay, that's a great question. Um, so, my my grandmother on my mom's side and her husband, my grandfather, were supposed to take a trip to New Orleans in 1984. Unfortunately, he he died suddenly. It was unexpected, but. Couldn't, I mean, obviously, she either had to, to go finish out the trip or cancel it. And she ended up taking me because it was around the time of my birthday. So we went to New Orleans for a week. I was 12. And there was, um, there was just, you know, live music, New Orleans Dixieland music, uh, most of it. But there were a few clubs where it was pop music. And one in particular, the drummer's back was to the sidewalk. And it was open air, so I could just like lean in and watch this guy play, and that blew my mind. He was playing a cross stick; I'd never seen it before. Just a cross stick on the snare with it with a groove, and it it was just like the most mind blowing, inspiring thing. Um, I think that was the first thing I saw live, other than all of the music in the basement with with the different bands, and that. Yeah, that was it. I mean, that's the one that's come to mind, that trip, just seeing a, a, a bunch of, of good music. So what do you like best about being a professional musician? You know, the bulk of my professional time was on the road with Air Force bands. I did that for 13 years uh, before doing a little less touring and doing some teaching at the Academy, Air Force Academy, before I retired. That was in 2016. And during that time, I mean, the best part was traveling and just getting into most of the places we played were either outdoor venues, 1,000, 2,000, as many as 5,000 people, or indoor venues that usually would speed anywhere from 500 to to 2,000. And so you really get into a rhythm of getting to a certain place at a certain time, setting up, jamming together with the rhythm section, maybe half hour to an hour, even stealing some practice, and just getting into a zone and then doing the shows. And the, the, the more you're on the road, uh, the more those shows, you really just got inside the music. You know? And I, there was always an open solo you know, on on uh, sing, sing, sing. or not that, not that it was all swing music. We would balance things with some Glenn Miller, some of that period, but with also brand new works too, so modern big band kind of stuff. And then we would also break down and do small group things, had a singer, and so it was a pretty cool show. But that was the most, that was my favorite part, really just so much playing that you were always uh, at the, at, I felt like I was always kind of at my peak because we were so busy. Um, I think I think that would be it. These days, Definitely the expanding into, into composition and leadership um, and really just playing the kind of music I want to play, whether it's mine or, or with someone else. You know, I, w- I usually get hired to play because of the way I play, not 
to do something too radically outside the box. Um, so I would say those those elements are the most satisfying about playing professionally. I love being in the studio too. It's fun. Right on. So when <laughs> all of this picks back up and we get back out to playing live shows, what do you hope not only the musician but the audience member uh, realizes or what revelations do you hope they get about this process? It's a great question. Well, I hope, um, you know, I think when it comes to getting back into places, we're going to have to think holistically kind of the way we're trying now, like businesses are closed or almost closed, yet they're they're staying open to some degree. There's got to be give and take is what I, w- what I would say. So we get into a club to play, for example, you know, what's it going to, what is it putting out a club owner after having been closed for months to have a band come in? And can we, can we see both sides? And for an audience coming in, you know, uh, what are they capable of doing? How do we, how do we all bring something to the table so everybody comes away with, with something? Audience comes in, gets the show, band comes in. Can we get paid? If so, how much? Uh, or maybe can we enter into a relationship where the gigs are going to come and eventually the money? Does that work for the owner? Um, just, just can't, we have to be thinking about each other and the, the all of the pieces of the puzzle, not just the not just the piece where we try to get a booking and get in there and get out of there and then try again and get in and get out. You know, really try to think about it holistically and long term. So my final question to you is this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans. Yeah. So you're living your life. Who do you think yeah. you are? Man, I think I am a guy, a musician, who uh, knows full well I'm going to draw my last breath doing the same thing I'm doing today, which is trying to be my best, trying to continue to improve, trying to continue to expand, and trying to continue to share what I have, because it's, it's all I have. Um, so, you know, at the age of 47, you know, my goals are to keep putting out music, keep sharing it, and, and try to get creative in a way that you know, allows me to continue doing it financially, uh, economically. But that, that's where I'm at. I, I am a person trying to make original music, um, with a you know trying to expand my friendship of musicians so that we can share in each other's vision and critically get it out to people to, to listen to. Right on, Paul. Thank you for taking some time out today. This extraordinary point in our human history and having a minute to talk about the music and what's going on in the world. Joe, thank you so much for having me, and uh, you continue to stay healthy and safe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Paul for his time, music, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.